everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar on minimal residual disease testing in uh, myeloma, organized, organized by Myeloma Patients Europe. Um, I am Silen Tensadam, uh, a research assistant at MPE. And before we start, um, I would like to go through some of the technical aspects of um, this Zoom webinar. Um, so first of all, uh, you should be able to see and hear all presenters, but you will not be able to see uh, or hear any other attendees. Uh, if you cannot hear uh, presenters, make sure that you the, your speakers are not muted and that the volume is set high. Um, the gallery view setting in, your, in Zoom enables you to see all the presenters in a tiled format on your screen. Um, and the view setting can be changed in the upper right corner of your screen. Um, please use the questions and answers feature, which is found in the uh, in the toolbar at the bottom of your window um, to ask questions to the panel. Um, and please do this throughout the, the whole um, event. Uh, and you can also click the like button for uh, specific questions to upvote uh, certain questions, which will let us know which ones are more interesting to you. Um, and you can also use the chat feature with other participants um, to share your experiences uh, or comments uh, on the current discussion. And if you are experiencing any, experiencing any technical issues, please let us know about it uh, in the chat and one of our colleagues can help you. Um, if you are having any troubles uh, with poor video or um, uh, the signal cutting out, uh, please consider attending uh, this event in audio mode only. This webinar will be is being recorded and will be available on our website and social media cha uh, channels. Um, thank you all again for joining and I will now briefly introduce MP and the agenda for this event. So Myeloma Patients Europe is an umbrella organization of uh, myeloma and AL amyloidosis patient um, organizations across Europe. And MPE currently has 48 members based in 31 countries. And our mission is to provide education and information and to support our member groups. Um, the project we are presenting today is part of MPE's patient evidence department, which was established to better understand what research gaps exist within uh, the myeloma landscape and to generate evidence that seeks to influence decision makers um, and ultimately improve uh, treatment care and access for all myeloma patients and their families. And over the past year, MP have conducted research to better uh, understand the patients and hematologist perspectives of MRD testing in myeloma. So the rationale uh, and results of this project on MRD will be presented shortly by myself. Um, and then uh, we will present, I will present the panelists um, for the day and that they will share with you their perspectives of MRD and debate different questions that arose through our research. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, all our panelists for joining today, and we will finish off the event um, with a questions and answers session as well. So before we begin, I would quickly like to give a brief overview on what uh, minimal residual disease is before going into the rationale and methods of our research project. Um, MRD refers to a very small number of cancer cells that remain in the body um, during or after treatment. Uh, MRD testing such as flow cytometry uh, and next generation sequences use it, uses advanced laboratory methods that can find one cancer cell amongst one million normal cells in, the, in a bone marrow sample. And these remaining cells uh, often cannot be detected through traditional tests of treatment response and may cause um, no physical symptoms. So positive MRD results indicates that cancer cells uh, were identified. Um, however, if a patient is MRD negative, meaning that no myeloma cells uh, are found at that sensitivity, um, it means that there's a very deep response 
And if this continues over time, it can potentially indicate a better prognosis. So whilst there um, is a wide range of scientific articles exploring uh, the application and use of MRD, there is a very limited number of studies assessing the qualitative perspectives of patients and clinicians uh, on the current uh, current and potential impact of MRD, and therefore this research project was designed to understand the patient and clinician experiences and perspectives of um, MRD and its potential uh, use in clinical practice. And it, um, our research explored the current and future uses of MRD and how the understanding and expectations of uh, the potential align or vary between patients and clinicians. And we also gathered pers perspectives on the use of MRD as a surrogate endpoint in clinical trials and in regulatory and reimbursement decisions. So for this project, we conducted a non-systematic literature review to identify themes related to MRD um, that uh, then underpinned uh, our discussion guides. And we then conducted individual interviews with nine European hematologists and held two focus groups with 14 European myeloma patients. And the interviews were then transcribed um, and thematically analyzed, and the results were written up in a uh, a report format. Um, the project's development was also followed and reviewed by a steering committee, which com comprised of patient experts, hematologists, researchers, and regulators. And I would just like to take a moment um, to thank everyone who took part in this research project, whether it was by taking part in interviews or by uh, reviewing documents throughout the project. Um, we really appreciate it, and this project would not have uh, been possible without you. So moving on to the results, um, to begin with, we wanted to understand how familiar uh, patients were with uh, MRD, and we found that there was quite a wide range of familiarity. Some patients were uh, completely unfamiliar, and one patient had uh, never heard of heard of MRD before joining the interview. Um, other patients were familiar with MRD testing but had no personal experience with it and only three patients had first-hand experience with MRD testing. Um, two uh, had undergone MRT, or MRD testing as part of a clinical trial um, and one uh, had undergone MRD testing in clinical practice. So patients found that MRD testing in clinical practice is very promising um, and stated that it would be uh, particularly useful if research showed that it is an indicator that maintenance therapy can be stopped. Um, most patients stated that they, they would be open um, to more frequent bone marrow tests, provided that the information was useful for treatment decision making. Um, they also agreed that they would uh, uh, undergo more frequent MRD testing if the methods were less invasive, um, such as through blood serums. Um, and patients also stated the importance of considering um, the potential cost of MRD testing and the implications of potential cost savings to healthcare systems um, from potentially stopping uh, maintenance treatment. So all hematologists who uh, participated in interviews were optimistic um, about poten the potential use of MRD testing in clinical practice. Um, some hematologists stated that their hospitals are increasingly requesting MRD testing among patients who have had maintenance therapy for several years and are considering stopping treatment, uh, either due to side effects or personal circumstances. Um, and in future, MRD testing may assist hematologists in reducing the overtreatment of patients. One um, healthcare professional uh, mentioned that they use MRD testing to determine whether or not to, uh, to perform a second stem cell transplant. So if a patient was uh, MRD negative after the first transplant, they would maybe decide not to do a second transplant. Um, and hematologists also emphasize the importance of 
being uh, transparent with patients and explaining that MRD testing is experimental and that evidence is still being collected. So without um, specific guidelines, hematologists decide individually or as an institution when to request MRD testing and how, uh, how to use the information. Um, so we gathered some of the key questions that patients and hematologists have regarding MRD. Um, and the main questions uh, are regarding treatment milestones or time points. Um, so when MRD testing should be done, um, whether the location of a biopsy matters in terms of uh, accuracy of the results and what additional uh, tests or risk assessments patients should undertake to uh, inform whether they can feel comfortable stopping maintenance therapy. Um, there are multiple barriers to MRD testing in clinical practice. Um, first of all, hematologists uh, noted that MRD testing, um, for MRD testing to be implemented implemented equitably across European countries, laboratory uh, capacity needs to be expanded. And many hematologists um, stated that laboratories conduct reliable and consistent tests. However, um, one hematologist had uh, observed that different laboratories um, produce different results for the same sample. Um, hematologists also uh, stated that they would need additional training on when to use MRD testing, how to apply the findings to guide decisions, and uh, on what to do with MRD uh, results if it conflicts with um, other relevant tests. Um, and lastly, hematologists commented that MRD testing is not covered by all insurers in all healthcare systems. And in some countries, uh, patients need to go out of pocket um, uh, to get MRD tested and may not fully understand why they need to pay um, extra for these additional tests. We also asked patients and hematologists about the impact of MRD testing on patients and their families. Um, and patients stated that their emotional responses would be unique to their circumstances. Um, several patients stated that uh, waiting for results uh, could be extremely stressful for them and their families. And on top of that, patients um, pointed out that the MRD biops biopsy technique uh, themselves can be burdensome for patients as these methods are quite invasive. Um, however, some patients did not anticipate a negative emotional impact and stated that the, the re MRD results could be useful for planning their, their personal lives, for example, whether to go uh, on a holiday or not. Um, and patients did em emphasize that a positive result would be much worse if no uh, alternative treatment option was available in their country. So we, we did ask interviewees uh, about strategies to managing the emotional impact of MRD testing and found that clear communication from hematologists is key. Um, hematologists should discuss the purpose of MRD testing and how the results may or may not guide uh, treatment decisions. Um, they should discuss what to expect during MRD testing and give uh, information about how to interpret the results. Um, it was also suggested that this should be delivered uh, through a telephone call or uh, through uh, or during a visit to allow patients to discuss the results um, and plan next steps. And alongside this, hematologists need to make sure that um, patients are provided with timely support, uh, for example, through peer support groups or through professional counselling. So in our research, we also explored the perspectives of patients and clinicians uh, on MRD as a surrogate endpoint. Um, and patients thought that it, if researchers demonstrate that MRD status is a reliable surrogate endpoint for survival outcomes, it would be an important advancement. However, some patients emphasize that they saw it only as additional information and not as a replacement for other lab tests. 
um, and several patients were concerned that if MRD status becomes a common uh, outcome measure in clinical trials, it could be used by government agencies and insurers to deny, uh, deny maintenance treatment uh, or withhold new and potentially ex uh, expensive treatments. Hematologists also saw a role of MRD testing in clinical trials, especially um, as an opportunity to make new treatments available sooner, but also showed um, some concerns. They stated that um, MRD testing should be a co-primary endpoint or support conditional approvals, but that larger and longer trials are needed to validate MRD as a surrogate endpoint. Um, and consensus is also needed regarding uh, when and how often MRD testing should be conducted. And hematologists also stated that um, research is needed to understand minimal clinic uh, clinically relevant differences in test uh, results between negative and positive um, MRD results and how MRD status co correlates with long-term uh, effects of relapse. Um, and lastly, although MRD testing is useful for many patients, there are some patients um, for whom it doesn't work, and it is important to explore this and how genetic profiles may uh, potentially contribute to this. So in conclusion, our research generated multiple recommendations, the first being um, that more research needs to be conducted and that the results need to be communicated with patients. Um, there needs to be clarity on how frequently MRD state, uh, tests should be uh, done and how the results should guide dis treatment decisions. Uh, additionally, as mentioned before, there needs to be better clarity on why MRD testing is predictive um, of improved survival in some patients, but not in others. The second recommendation we have is that um, it is crucial to place the patient needs at the center of MRD testing. Um, Hematologists need to provide timely and co convenient emotional support for patients and their families and deliver MRD tests uh, with the potential for, for patients to discuss next steps. The last recommendation we have um, is to develop training and resources for patients and healthcare professionals. Um, as a myeloma community, we need to develop introductory materials for patients and their families um, on what MRD is, how it is tested, and what the results mean. Um, and we also need to develop information for healthcare professionals about when and how to how MRD results should guide treatment decisions, uh, and also develop training for laboratory staff. So following the recommendations, um, we have worked closely with stakeholders to develop educational materials as a first plan of action. Um, firstly, we have written up an advocacy report on this project, uh, which is well, uh, as well as uh, an extensive questions and answers um, document. Um, and we have also created an educational video on uh, MRD, uh, which have been uh, sent in the chat or should be sent now. Um, and you can find all these resources on our website and um, our virtual exhibition room, which, um, yeah, again, should be sent in the chat now. Um, and after this event, we plan to continue to engage with um, the myeloma clinical community to discuss the dis direction of MRD. And we will also continue to engage with FPA on surrogate endpoints and develop further um, educational materials for our members across Europe. So I would now like to um, uh, take some time to introduce our five panelists um, for the day. Welcome. Um, first of all, we have um, Hans Schröer, uh, who is a myeloma patient and the chair of the work group of European Cancer Patient Advocacy Networks. 
Um, next, we have Dr. Martin Kaiser, a hematologist at the Royal Marsden Hospital and Institute of Cancer Research in London. Um, next, we have Dr. Bruno Paiva, a researcher at the Clinica Universidad de Navarra in Spain. Um, we also have Veronica uh, Calzada, who is an oncology novel endpoint uh, representative at the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations. And lastly, we have uh, Paula von Hennig, who is the Director of Regulator Regulatory Sciences at ProPharma. Um, I would now like to pass the floor on to Eric Lowe, uh, who will be moderating our panel discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Lean, and thanks for a, a great, great presentation. Uh, it's definitely stirred up a bunch of questions and emotions for me, so I'm sure it's done the very same with the uh, panel. So I'm sure we're in for a really dynamic and robust uh, discussion in the next uh, hour or so. So first off, uh, my name is Eric Lowe. It's a great honor to have been asked by MPE to moderate this uh, webinar on MRD. I'm a huge fan of... Um, Malama Patients Europe. I have got huge respect for their work. And also it's it's an honor to uh, be moderating the discussion between some really brilliant uh, panel, panel members. So the first thing that we're gonna do is just give each of the panel members two or three minutes just to respond to um, the um, findings of the MPE report and just sort of give some commentary on and reflections uh, from kind of their perspective. I, I'm not. I'm not sure uh, what the best order to do it is. Uh, whether I look at my sheet and copy it, but I think we should start with hands. It's always good to start and end with patients. Uh, so hands, uh, I'd be interested in your reflections and thoughts on Celine's presentation and the findings in, of the report, and then I will just go back to my list and follow it in the order I was given. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Eric and Saline, uh, for introducing this uh, interesting um, uh, this interesting webinar on MRD. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to join the MRD panel discussion to be able to provide a patient perspective that is also captured in the research project itself. Uh, first, I would like to express the innova that innovation is not similar to improvements of myeloma care and cures. It highly depends on the use of the innovation and where to it is used and what questions or AMAT needs are addressed. So in the case of MRD testing, it is more or less, although from the patient perspective seen, a fine tuning of the remission. That is when having a complete remission, I would say. When you are in a complete remission or a stringent complete remission, the MRD test is the finest test to show that. Um, to show how deep your remission is. And that is more than a nice to know. Uh, when in a deep remission, MRD negative, uh, no uh, malignant plasma cells detected on the MRD test level, it is a very deep remission. This means for the patient, the treatment was remarkable effective. It killed almost all my cancer cells. That is what you want to hear from your doctor for sure. It contributes highly to your, to your mood, your spirit to continue the quality of life. Also for the family around the patient. The other thing is when you reach MRD negativity, it means mostly that within your bones, there is no, now plenty of space to grow healthy bone marrow. And that means that your blood normalizes. And with that, you get back energy over time and there is more space for your body in general to recover parts that were affected by the malignant cells before the treatment. Uh, so yes, knowing that you are MRD negative has many positive implications for the patient. It's about the impact on the daily life and life perspectives. The third and last aspect I would like to mention is that MRD is measured by a bone marrow punction. And many patients fear that. The important measure points to detect how treatment is working can solve this. Looking at the use in clinical practice, it might be good to just do the regular checks through blood serum, where you can look at the levels of M protein and light chains, etc. besides all the other indicators that say something about your health. 
Uh, and it's a no-brainer to state, I think, that MRD testing is not very eligible for daily, weekly, monthly checks. You need to define specific moments to put in MRD testing to check the status of the disease. Like before treatment to have a starting point and a point a few months later, maybe three months later, that depends on the treatment, it differs from treatment to treatment, when you could assume that a remission is reached. So uh, you use MRD fine tuning of the state of the disease on meaningful moments that are for sure meaningful moments for the patient and its family. Interesting in this research is that patients responded that they are not against the MRD testing in clinical practice if they understand what it adds. So explanation is important. If it's used before start of the treatment and a few months later after start would reach a complete or stringent complete remission, these are moments that are important and for sure for patients. I think results of MRD testing should therefore be shared with the patient and the family when known. It says, look, this is what my treatment did with me. Knowledge is fuel for a positive spirit to adapt to your patient life, to your perspective. Uh, one point, MRD testing is uh, in the blood is in development, not uh, reliable yet as the bone marrow puncture method, but a promising future looking at the lesser impact on the burden for the disease. Uh, there is more to say to this, but I would like to leave it this <laughs> to this for now. So we have enough points left for the discussion. Thank you for listening. Yeah, Th thanks Hans. I mean, you raised a number of great kind of points there. We will come back to you later because what I, I really want to explore with you is, is the decisions that patients need to make in their life beyond just that treatment decision, because there's, there seems there's a bias towards just this treatment decision as being the be all, be all and end all. But of course, it's not like that when you're a patient. So I'd love to explore that in a bit more depth with you uh, later on in the webinar. So I'm going to move now to Martin. You're next on the on the list, Martin. So we'd be interested in your reflections on the uh, MPE report. Yeah, I think there's you know lots of excitement, and I think generally when we have newer ways of assessing the disease, um, I think this is this is always you know really uh, exciting and um, a good prospect. But I think one of the things, of course, that has come through to me in the results is that question: what to do with the results? Um, and and there is still. A lot to be learned. This is not meaning that you know we will never get these results. We will get these results. There's lots of research going on, uh, but um, in daily practice, uh, I completely you know can resonate with what Hans has just said. Just the flip side is one of the comments I've seen in in the report as well. Is a patient uh, voiced? It's it's nice when your MRD is negative, but what it, what is it if it's not negative and and that's a difficult one um i think i'm feeling you know definitely bruno will contribute here far more and there are more and more exciting uh areas evolving where it could be of much use i think bruno's most recent work on car t cell mrd for example is really stunning but the area where we're using it most is for example after an autologous transplant because we're doing a bone marrow biopsy there anyway and that's the one indication where our hospital gave us the permission to do the test, which I just had an email about today, actually. It takes six times longer to use the machine to do an MRD test, which is flow-based at our laboratory, than the normal standard flow cytometry. So they want from us to know exactly which patients we want to test, because ultimately it's a capacity question in our healthcare system, unlike in, pub in private healthcare systems, as in the US, where the test might generate an income for the hospital. It doesn't. In our hospital, we have to say you know, what is the best use because there's only a certain limited capacity. And we're doing it in those after transplant. Now, the interesting question there is, of course, I always like to transmit the result of a negative test result uh, in MRD uh, um, to a patient, which is always great. But even if I transmit the result of a positive result, I have to tell the patient, I don't quite know yet what that means, because at that point, they have just had their transplant. They're still starting consolidation. They're still starting maintenance treatment. They might well still turn MRD negative, and we know that again from work 
I feel like I'm I'm the I'm the minor contributor here. Bruno has generated most of the evidence, but um, there is, for example, data from from a number of trials, from from one that used exazomib, where a lot of patients that were MRD positive still early after transplant, even with even when they took placebo, turned out to be MRD negative six months or twelve months later. So it's it's a bit that question what to do with the information and and for us to yep. really find the sweet spot where where we can use the test best i think is uh, probably what came through to me in the in the answers as well from the patients thanks thanks martin and I'm, I'm trying to contain myself here for not jumping in and asking questions but but that conundrum is true to a lesser or greater extent with existing tests even a power protein test is the same jeopardy the same unpredictability potentially so, so patients are still having to go through that difficult discussion of a, yeah, your power proteins drop this much or that much, and then is it the magnitude of response or the duration of response and how it pans out over time. And although we've got more, I think, clinical practice on power protein, for example, it's still, it's, there's still jeopardy there for patients. It's still, and I think with tests like MRD, it's the context that surrounds it as much as it is the result it's, itself. But anyway, uh, Bruno, um, you are the, the main man when it comes to uh, MRD. You're next on my list, and it looks like that's perfect because Martin has set you up brilliantly for your reflections on, on the MPE report. Thank you so much, Eric, for the, the kind words and introduction. First, let me thank the, the, the big effort and an important point to conduct this initiative also for the questioner, I think it's very, very important. And in my view, it reflects very well where we are at the moment and what efforts should be done for the future, particularly to provide lights and answers to some of the questions that remain unresolved and that we very well see in uh, slides presented before. <laughs> Uh, also, following on uh, Dr. Kaiser's words, uh, I should say that, uh, in my opinion, MRD has been one of those fields where we have been blessed by seeing so many and uh, valuable contributions coming really from all over the world. Uh, the UK group, one of the, the groups contributing the most to this field, in myeloma and beyond. And I think that's one of the reasons why we are here today talking about uh, MRD, the fact that uh, we have seen systematically across the years and across the globe positive, informative, reproducible results. And this is not trivial from the perspective of laboratory diagnostics to see a biomarker, a test, that from study after study, cooperative group after cooperative group, we continue seeing the same positive sound results. And this is why, in my opinion, MRD is one of the most informative prognostic factors in myeloma. Now, this being said, it's not perfect. In fact, it's far from perfect. And I think that MRD alone and perhaps this applies to virtually all biomarkers, is capable of discriminating different groups of patients that may have different um, expected progression free survival. But it's very hard to predict at the individual patient level. And to really predict outcomes at the individual patient level, MRD is just another layer of information that should be integrated with all other uh, patient and tumor uh, features. And I think that uh, Dr. Kaiser highlighted this extremely well, particularly given the dynamics of the MRD status that may well fluctuate over time and thereby also its prognostic value. A final comment, and uh, to, to avoid stretching too much my time, uh, from the laboratory, we hear the patient perspective and uh, we understand. And uh, since uh, already a few years, we and others around the globe are working hard 
towards developing more minimally invasive MRV testing. Yep. Definitely to uh, avoid those invasive and uh, painful tests for the patient. This was well pointed out in, 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 uh, in the first part of, the, of today's meeting. And secondly, because we believe also that to provide better information, information that can be potentially used to fine tune the management of the patient, you need to rely on frequent testing. And frequent testing can only be done in a minimally intensive sample. Yep. This is where we are aiming in the next few years. Thank you. Yeah, there are some really, really excellent points there, uh, at Bruno. And I think it's just, it, it, it's complex myeloma, predictability, risk stratification, it is so challenging. And, and I can't help thinking that we need to look to the next five or 10 years rather than the past five or 10 years, because I think as cell and gene therapies come online and, and, and decisions about who gets them and who doesn't get them and what happens next, we need to have, I think, really spectacular information to do that and MRD could be one way in which we could do that so there's lots to think about there but we'll move on and and Veronica you're next on my uh list um so we'd love to hear your your um I mean obviously you can introduce yourself as well uh, you've got an interesting title novel endpoint representative so it looks like this is this is in your sweet spot here from a, an, a, an endpoint perspective. So we'd love to hear your perspectives. Yeah, indeed. Thank you so much. So good afternoon to all. Thank you to MPE for, for this opportunity. It's a pleasure for me today to represent the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industries and Associations perspective. We like to initiate by highlighting what the findings reflect to us uh, uh, as FPA. So first and foremost, ensuring that we hear the patient perspective connected to the science and how both intersect is meaningful to this community. The report shows the potential use and implementation of MRD, as well as flags important considerations that may influence the approvals and reimbursement decisions in certain populations. There is a big opportunity uh, to amplify the use of MRD as a tool to guide decision-making and the value in combining MRD with patient reported outcomes to enable greater correlation with overall survival, as well as measuring you know, outcomes of high importance for patients living with multiple myeloma. What we have seen all across you know, our discussions is that one of the main barriers to use MRD as an endpoint in regulatory and reimbursement decision-making is the level of uncertainty about the long-term clinical and economic outcomes associated with implementation and interpretation of the results. As pointed out in the research, we shall address this uncertainty by providing guidelines and standardizing MRD measurement across hospitals and countries as much as possible. Addressing this uncertainty will be key in ensuring you know, the adoption of MRD status as an endpoint in clinical trials and beyond that can be used to support regulatory and reimbursement decision-making. I would like to finalize by mentioning like FPS stands for the recognition and valuation of these endpoints beyond overall survival that will give the benefit that can bring to patients and the wider healthcare system. It is now important for stakeholders to work collaboratively and ensure that reimbursement decision-making evolves to include the use of novel endpoints as well as to paving the way for the innovation that is coming. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Veronica. Some really important points, and I, I think you kind of, and we'll get into this a little bit. And I should really be be quiet, but I, but I think that, you know, even existing endpoints such as PFS, for example, in myeloma is somewhat uncertain, right? It, it's there's the, the jury's out about whether it predicts for overall survival, and you know the FDA are making changes to their uh, their uh, guidance around making sure that there's follow-on trials for OS and things. So. So again, for me, it, it, it's not sort of singling out an endpoint, it's looking at them in, in the round and thinking how they collectively contribute to painting a more certain picture for, 
response and risk uh, in myeloma because there is a lot of uncertainty. Um, and I'm interested in what's a novel endpoint versus not a novel endpoint, right? What, what's important is what is the endpoint that's needed, <laughs> whether it's novel or not, you know? So there's lots to unpick there in terms of what do we mean by novel endpoints? But that's that's for later. Paula, last but not least, we're over to you for your uh, per perspectives. Then we're going to come back to you, Hans. Yes, yeah, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, well, the, the way I, I read the report is indeed there's a, a, a general interest in, in MRD from both patients and physicians, uh, as already also stated by the other panelists. And, um, and I also uh, saw in the report that um, patients who have the knowledge of, uh, of MRD also see the potential of use, in, in particular in relation to making treatment decisions. It's also clear uh, that there's inequality of um, uh, in, in knowledge and access to MRD between and within European countries. Um, in addition, it seems to be uh, there seems to be a shared understanding that there's currently not enough information to use MRD either for treatment decisions and or regulatory decision making. And I want to um, uh, sort of um, relate to what you, your your comment to your comment just now is that. Uh, I think it is very important to uh, decide uh, what information is necessary to use MRD for in which particular situation, whether it's for treatment decision or regulatory decision making or anything else. So I think uh, that determines the requirements and I will get that uh, to that later, I guess, during the panel discussion. Um, but my impression from the report is also that patients and physicians and sponsors, uh, and I took the letter from, from other meetings, uh, are in general very eager uh, to, to get to the point, indeed to, to, to use the potential of MRD. Um, uh, at the same time, and that has also already been mentioned, some patients are quite uh, skeptical towards um, uh, the use of MRD uh, so that is, it's going to be used to deny access to relatively expensive treatments rather than providing the best treatment for the right patient at the right time. While that is actually, of course, uh, why we are all here. Yeah. In my, my view, the, the first, so, so you, trying to use MRD for regulatory decision making requires large quantities of patient level data collected in a standardized manner. Uh, the latter, so really to address the skepticism with patients, I would say that requires building of trust by being transparent on rules and requirements, plans and results every step of the way. And I must say that the plans that are uh, laid, out, laid down by uh, MPA, uh, I think are, are a good, uh, good step in that direction. Thank you. Brilliant, Paula, really excellent points there. And, a, and a, kind of good, a good reminder at the end of the day that this is all about making good decisions for patients, right patient, right treatment right time and just making sure we've got the right information to do that of which endpoints are part of it but holistic needs assessments all kinds of things should feed into that to that decision so uh, it's, it's a nice segue into our sort of first question for the panel which is around the role of MRD in in, in treatment decision making and the utility of MRD in in clinical practice I'm going to start with <clears throat> you, Hans, and, and Martin for the first kind of question, and it's very much around looking at it through a sort of patient a patient lens in um, what, what, what the impact potentially is on patients and their carers and their loved ones about knowing their MRD status, whether that's positive or negative. Um, whether you want to know or not hands as a patient um and you know you can very well think about the impact of mrd positivity but what's the impact of mrd negativity and both you and martin touched on that uh seconds ago so so hands what we'll start with you just to sort of shine a brighter torch a little bit on on the your perspectives and with the patients that you work with and knowing their mrd status yeah, uh, well, uh, th that's an important point. And also, uh, I, uh, I think Martin raised that point as well. Um, I, I think for most patients, it is um, 
important to know how deep the remission is. It was also, it is also before we had MRD uh, that you wanted to know if you are, had a partial remission or uh, a, a good remission, very good partial remission, complete remission, shrink and remission, and what that means. That you have to ex explain that as a doctor. And that, that, that's, that, that's important information to uh, also support shared decision making between a doctor and a patient. And not every patient wants to know, but I would say uh, put it on the patient portal and let the patient decide if he wants to know uh, his, his result or rather wait until he speaks his doctor and uh, give uh, info. So that, that might depend on, on the one patient and another. So I think it's for a patient important where he stands, what, what's the disease? Also, when it is negative, uh, because you need to, uh, the cancer diagnosis was already uh, a negative message, but it is just uh, how it is, the reality. So you need to adapt to that. And uh, you can only adapt to a situation when you know where you stand. So that is why I'm in favor of just sharing it with the patient, tell him, him, him or her what, what it means, um, uh, and uh, discuss what, what the options are. Yep. And Hans, could you just give us a flavor of, because I, I don't want this just to be about treatment decisions because patients um, live complex lives, right? Um, myeloma may not be the only challenge they have. There may be comorbidities. There's things going on financially, uh, at work, stress, mental health. There's all kinds of things that go on in, in normal day-to-day -day life. So could you just give us a flavor of what types of non-treatment decisions that patients have to make and, and how important it might or might not be knowing their MRD status? Um, yeah, well, that, that's a pretty broad and difficult question because it depends from, from one to another, like you already said. But um, to uh, know that, uh, especially of course uh, when uh, you reached a very deep remission that 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 gives uh, um, fuel for uh, uh, for um, filling in uh, the perspective of the life you have so uh, that that's for sure important and uh, also for i think uh, you avoided that point but i think treatment decision is also important uh, in that sense, uh, to um, and that's maybe for for later because it needs a lot of research. If an MRD point uh, means that you can, for example, have a treatment-free interval, um, or uh, choose for maintenance uh, therapy, uh, those are things you need to discuss with your patient. Uh, do you feel secure for that? And if uh, if you have done uh, uh, an, a very deep remission measured. Uh, it's extra information for the patient to help uh, make a decision with, with your doctor on having, for example, a treatment-free interval so you can recover a bit and you avoid unnecessary toxicity. Brilliant. We're slightly over time, which is my fault because I'm doing things I wasn't told to do and told not to do. So, so we'll, we'll move on to you, Kenna Martin. And obviously... You, like many doctors, see patients in clinic of all types, all shapes, sizes, ages, perspectives. Um, wh wh what's your, your feelings around the potential impact of, of knowing uh, patients knowing their MRD status? I think it can be very useful, um, but I think it is something that has come through already in the comments, but also in, from the previous discussions, it is a tool among several and in some sense it will be the most powerful if you are really having detailed conversations with an expert team um, about what the result means. I think it is very clear also for more recent evidence that on its own it is a result that can be useful but the interpretation of it, what it means for you will be sitting best with you personally if you have multiple areas and multiple inputs of information. So one of the things that we have, for example, learned through 
through a trial that was performed in, in the US um, where people stopped treatment after they had continued MRD negativity was that if their disease had very high risk features, it was still at risk of coming back earlier, um, even if they were MRD negative. And it was quite an interesting study because it showed that those with this high risk features had the same rate of MRD negativity. So then the same number of patients went MRD negative as others. Of course, that is a subgroup, a smaller subgroup of patients. And uh, for the majority still, uh, you know, the finding did translate into a long uh, treatment free period. But I think it just shows um, that that it is, uh, I think, going to be one of the things that is happening anyway, is this specialization of myeloma <laughs> teams. And think, especially when thinking about an MRD test, it sits best for you if you are under a team that has lots of other um, inputs and, and, and lots of other insights into your disease as well. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's the, the nature of things across many cancers. Now, that's not myeloma specific, but I think it will be developing into a very powerful tool the more and more people are knowing how to integrate it with other areas of information. Makes perfect sense. Thanks, Martin. Uh, Bruno, we're going to come to you next, if if that's okay. And I'm going to combine two questions I I into one. So, um, and, and I know we've covered some of this, but from your perspective, what are the potential um, benefits and risks of using MRD testing to make treatment decisions? And, and the second part of the question is, how far away are we from realizing the potential benefit of MRD testing in clinical practice? That's very difficult uh, questions for, for which I think there is no right or wrong answer. I think that, uh, uh, so let me say something different. Being myself uh, uh, a patient, not with myeloma, but uh, with uh, arthritis, uh, I would like to have myself all the information that I could on my disease. And I would definitely want my physician to have all the information for whatever decision she makes from now on. And I think that this is reasonable to, to ask and to understand as well from, the, from, at least from my patient perspective. Now, regarding the remission, I know from the information on my articulation that I'm not in remission. <laughs> I don't need more techniques to, to know that. But uh, I do, and we have discussions about this. I'm sorry for, for changing gears into another disease, but uh, I do understand that you, you really want to have all types of information to make an informed decision. And on the other hand, I do realize that despite the robustness of one biomarker to inform on the patient's status on a certain metric of the disease, and despite all the evidence that may or not be accumulated, still at the end of the day, there is no link between a result and a decision. And at the end, it would be the best judgment of of uh, the physician to, to do in consensus with the patient what is best uh, next. Now, regarding where we were, where we are, and uh, what will come next, I think that uh, for MRD myeloma, I do believe that we will learn quite significantly in the next few years. Because in the next few years, I'm confident that we will see a lot of scientific contributions from many groups around the world with MRD assessment in clinical trials that have some sort of treatment question about intensity or duration where MRD was systematically measured using the best methods standardized and optimized and endorsed by the International Myeloma Working Group. In other words, we will learn from many, many, many trials in the next few years, trials that have a design that was not there in the past and trials that have been using the same MRD methods, meaning that we can learn from one study, one study 
to another. So I think that uh, in, in, in comparison to the last few years, the next few years will have something new of additional value that we haven't had until now. Brilliant. Well, that, that makes perfect uh, sense, Bruno. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we're going to move over to questions around MRD as a, a surrogate endpoint. And they're mostly going to be directed towards um, Veronica and, and Paula, but others can, can kind of pitch in if they want. So, so I guess we know there's some, some uh, issues around MRD as an endpoint. Um, and it's kind of plausibility. I mean, I think there's challenges with endpoints um, generally, but there seems to be a strong push from the community that MRD should be an endpoint, uh, a, a regulatory endpoint. And I'm aware of conversations that the, I guess the great and the good of my loam have had with FDA and others about making the case for MRD uh, as an endpoint. There's, there's also some unanswered questions from the report around sort of the cadence of MRD testing, uh, all that kind of stuff, which need to be to be addressed. So Veronica, I'll come to you first. So from your perspective, what are the main unanswered questions or evidence gaps or sort of trip hazards that are still in place that, that are hindering the approval of MRD as a surrogate endpoint? Thank you, Eric. I believe uh, uh, both Bruno and Martin have outlined very clearly on, on the gaps that we have different levels um, among laboratories, technologies, you know, having in place different protocols, uh, standard, I mean, in, in general, in a nutshell, the standardization process is something that we need to ensure it takes place for decision-making processes within all the steps that uh, we as manufacturers follow, meaning from regulatory to, you know, HDA appraisals, and then it comes, you know, also the, the data uncertainty translated to payers, and what is the data generation needed to demonstrate this correlation. So everything is, is connected. I mean, I, I will probably like to, to comment more in the sense of, we have outlined right now, the still, you know, uncertainty and the data gaps that from the clinical perspective, we, we need to all together come through. I think the role of us as industry is really to take an active role together with the community on this evidence generation, uh, on the value of MRD in clinical trials to make this bridge of improvements of MRD negativity and the long-term uh, uh, feasibility and how this is translated to quality of life. And we have also, uh, as Bruno was saying on this learning, that industry has also a role to play on disseminating this evidence through different platforms and how we bring all the stakeholders together on really you know, our experiences in clinical trials also together with the scientific community and patients for sure on, on discussing the still the unmet needs as uh, Hans was mentioning. Great, thanks Veronica. And, and Paula, what, what would your response be to, to that question? Um, yeah, well, actually, I, I, of course, I've been thinking about this for, for, for some time, but um, I'm actually a bit unsure on whether there is, is a sufficient agreement among the stakeholders on, on what would be required to use MRD as a, state, as a registration endpoint. And I mean, and stakeholders are the patients, the physicians, the payers, the HTA, the regulators, and of course, and ph pharmaceutical companies, right? And, and then of course, there's the, the challenge uh, because interests are not the same. So there should be put effort to find really the, the, common, the common ground uh, in, in that. And, I'm, and I, I'm actually convinced that it, is, that it is possible, of course, because in yeah. the end, uh, I mean, if you can use MRD as a registrational endpoint, it means that you have also sufficient information to make treatment decisions, which could be a benefit of the patient. And it can also allow patients to decide whether they want to uh, uh, buy a new house or uh, not at this, at this point, right? Uh, and the same as that payers can, can say there's sufficient evidence to, to, to reimburse this, this treatment uh, at, uh, for this patient at this time. So I really think that, you know, the, the requirements for decision-making, that is something that uh, I would hope uh, 
you know, could be could be answered uh, um, in in a, in a in a sound way, and that and because that will also shape um, the, the 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 data collection. And I must also say that another thing that uh, what I've always sort of you know missed in all the discussion is is the impact of the dur durability of MRD because having a deep response may not just may just not be sufficient to say that this is a, the, the, the best predictor for long-term benefit. I think the durability of, of MRD um, may fit in as well. And that can also help in, in understanding why um, an MRD in, 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 uh, for a patient with a high risk profile multiple myeloma is not, has not the same value as, as a patient with a, with a lower risk uh, type of myeloma. Yeah, no, it raised some important points, and I, I'm, I'm just sort of, as I'm thinking through through this as a sort of averagely smart layperson, I'm sure that that you guys, the panelists, could have a two week congress on MRD, and and it still wouldn't be enough time to talk through all the different layers and co complexities that that we have. Um, Hans, you very kindly, very politely put your hand up to to jump in, so we'll we'll, we'll come to you next. I, I just wanted to add something what Paula said. Um, the, I, I think the durability is also for patient groups. We discuss this also uh, more than often because we are approached to have an opinion on MRD and that's why we have this research done uh, anyhow. But uh, that's also for patient groups very important. Uh, I mean, one of the concerns patients, uh, uh, patient groups had uh, when MRD was coming up is that it's on one hand, uh, it says something on the, uh, the power of a new treatment, uh, looking at, for example, in the real life refractory myeloma uh, patients in the latest stage, you have the, those immunotherapies and you suddenly saw that where the, the, the stage where the disease is very aggressive, uh, people get uh, MRD, uh, MRD negative um, results, which was spectacular, I must say. But when MRD would be an endpoint, uh, and you look at, for example, at the first stage where people just have, have had the, uh, the, their di diagnose, and you uh, focus on getting MRD uh, uh, results as, as a company uh, to, get, to get your uh, market authorization, we feared that the treatment would be too, uh, too toxic for a patient just to get that MRD result. So very heavy. Uh, so that's why we said, well, we are very much in favor of uh, putting MRD uh, in the spotlight. Um, uh, also for, M uh, for, for patients, it's important to know how deep your response is, but it goes hand in hand with knowing what the long-term toxicity is, especially when we know that myeloma patients live longer with myeloma, it's important to also keep an eye on the long-term effects. Yep, no, really important points, Hans. Um, Paula, you, you raised a really uh, crucial, or you said a crucial word there, consensus. Um, and it would be good just to explore that for the next kind of couple of minutes, because I, I, I think getting consensus is absolutely critical to the next steps in MRD. Easier said than done. I think that, you know, sometimes on the outside looking in, the impression I get is different stakeholders, even different people in the same stakeholder group. It's like we're all on jet skis, zipping around the lake a little bit, all different directions. But we all actually need to be in the same rowing boat, rowing in the same direction. And, and, and I think MRD, if we're, and it sounds like there is this energy and this vision for MRD to be, to be there. Um, but unless we get consensus, unless we take a very strategic and thoughtful and collaborative stepwise approach to it and come out the other side with sort of implementable and transactable solutions, we, we might miss the goal a little bit. And that would be devastating, I think, for all, all of us. So how do we get that consensus? I mean, all groups are represented on this kind of panel. How do we get consensus? What are the steps that we we need to take in order to get consensus? I think that was a direct question to me, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so it, I think it is, um, it is, I think that the, the common ground that I refer to is really about uh, the topics that we can agree on, but it's also about the uncertainties that we uh, can accept. Um, because I think if you, if you collect data, 
um, from uh, from different different trials, uh, and even in in a standardized manner, and you do a meta analysis. That is, I think, would be a very good start. I think for uh, and that would be of interest to all stakeholders mentioned. I would say. However, it, it was very possible that you know um, it, for some stakeholders there will be remaining uncertainties, and I think it would be good to to lay those down and and also describe you know this would be uh, acceptable to us in relation to uh, re reimbursement, for instance, by uh, also being flexible in the type of reimbursement reimbursement given, like uh, give a conditional uh, form in that respect. And, and depending on the longer term results, uh, you, you may change uh, that to, uh, uh, let's say, a full reimbursement, similar as you have a conditional and a full approval in the regulatory yeah. system. Sounds very sensible, pragmatic. Uh, Martin? And I think that, oh, sorry. Sorry, that's the, sorry, that's just indeed the word, pragmatic, right? I think there's a lack of data, we need to collect data. And let's then see what we what we have. Do this in, in in the best possible way, and then see what we have. But accept uncertainties, which may be fulfilled in in the longer term. Thank you. Yeah. No, thanks, Paul. And, and I think there's a difference between uh, volume of data versus the right data. And, and I think that volumes of data can actually be counterproductive. You know, we need to be rational and thoughtful in in not just throwing spaghetti at the wall and hoping some sticks, but be very thoughtful and aligned about what the remaining questions are and what research, uh, what, what, what the best research designs are to get the answers with all stakeholders involved in that research design, especially downstream decision makers. Uh, Martin, uh, over, over to you. Yeah, I cannot agree more, but I actually really want to make a, a case here for the excellent work that people like Bruno, Dr. Paiva, you know, have been doing which it looks like he even ha might have MRD data on his screen actually um, that he's <laughs> <laughs> it's in the corner of the image here <laughs> what I'm trying to say is actually um, you know the work that that Bruno has done and others are doing and and you know in, in, in other categories a lot of researchers are doing should not be underestimated and this is actually including for example developing the methods sharing the methods making the methods into tests um, that people can use and, and clinicians and researchers can use everywhere, that is not a small feat here. And it has been, I think, one of the things that have been, um, yeah, not in the focus of the drug um, producing industry. And as such, I think have been underfunded for quite a long time. I think we're, we're fortunate that we are seeing more and more attention in this. And I think this webinar is one of the you know, important signals of that, but the, the work that has been going into this has been really Herculean. And I think you cannot do a meta-analysis if people haven't thought about already 10 years ago, you know, what methods everyone could access and everyone could use in the future. And I think this is really, um, you know, fantastic to be on such a panel together here with one of the people that have been working towards this for such a long time. Um, uh, amongst with many others, but I think it's it's actually something that I would say uh, is important to realize what contribution academic research is doing, uh, because that would not have happened had there been only um, the research that was ultimately incentivized. And I think there's no no moral judging, but you know the people that are producing drugs they only can address what producing drugs actually entails. I think I think the a lot of the other research came from other areas and of course enclosed, entailed a lot of patients as well that participated in that research. Yeah, um, so uh, all roads and all things lead to Bruno. <laughs> so I, I hope you've got big shoulders, Bruno, because I think, you know, I think Martin's right and I've been working in my Loma my entire career I'm scared to tell you how long that is um but when I think about MRD I think about you <laughs> um so so what what's your thoughts around how we get consensus and 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 how we address the outstanding questions well start this is really a team effort and um and uh, picking up on on one of the last sentences from Martin, uh, it's it's true that uh, uh, we need to we need the support 
in the country in the cumulative work from everyone to really produce uh, high quality data and i believe it was you Eric, that said it's not that much about the amount but the quality and uh, that particularly applies to the sterling issue that i would like to, to briefly address uh, in, in my comments and uh, we can always improve but i would even say that uh, fortunately in the last few years we have seen how perhaps 10 15 years ago it was uh, uh, we in academia that were making uh, the effort of developing the methods and uh, testing them in in prospective studies more recently we have, we have seen how this testing is really present in I would say 99% of all new prospective studies, regardless if these are from academia or from uh, pharmaceutical companies. And I think that uh, this is something of uh, high value. It's not, uh, uh, I would say it's not unusual, but uh, at the same time, I would say myeloma is a special example across malignant hematology, where, where we are seeing this kind of collaboration and combined effort can always improve, but I would be on the positive, optimistic side. And as Martin said, the fact that this has been ongoing for the past few years has enabled all the data that can be analyzed in a meta-analysis fashion for other, other contributions beyond what MRD can offer in terms of prognostic value and eventually treatment decisions, that is the value of surrogacy. Now, to answer, to, to, to provide my, my comment on the surrogacy, as this was addressed before, uh, in my opinion, investigating it is of immense value without knowing what would be the results of that. In my opinion, at the moment, it's highly unpredictable what will happen, but it is an immense value because having the possibility of knowing very early on in, uh, let's say, six to 12 months, what is the added value of a new schema, a new drug or a new schema in compared to uh, the standard of care, I think it's extremely valuable. And it's bidirectional. And I'm saying this because of one, uh, one sentence I saw before you at the beginning of our webinar. It's ideally, it's to accelerate the access to new drugs for patients. And, and it would never preclude or exclude the access to those drugs. However, it could also be information to identify or to detect a signal very early on that this new iter iteration on the treatment is not really or will likely not improve progression free and eventually overall survival. And I think this is, this, this is equally important. Now, it's a completely different uh, mindset when compared to the classical role of MRD as a prognostic factor. Here is really to make sure whatever difference we see in MRD negative rates in two different treatment strategies will correlate in the benefit what is most important to the patient that is survival. So as you can imagine, this is very important and not easy to establish. It's about predicting in the future in what is most important to the patient based on the result that is being measured six or 12 months after treatment was initiated. This is why we need huge amounts of data, high quality data. In my view, we are at, on the, at, at the half of that process because all the data may not have the, the enough quality for this kind of uh, meta-analysis. And without knowing what the future will tell us about the results, I think that because of what I said in the beginning, it is of immense value to at least try study and see if there is some role out of it either now or potentially in five, 10 years based on continuous accumulation of data. I had a final, oh yeah, as 
always, and as I was saying at the beginning, and many have mentioned this, that it will never be isolated. And MRD will never ever provide 100% uh, uh, final answer because a certain schema may not uh, induce uh, a prolonged progression free survival in a randomized trial, but may improve the quality of life of the patient. And this is equally important, this is very important as well and cannot be measured on MRD. So MRD may help, but would never ever be the sure. solution for all the treatments. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, Hans, we'll come to you. And then uh, there's a couple of things we've got to do in the last sort of 10 or 15 minutes. One is I uh, have a little bit of a q and A. I'm looking at the Q&A box and there's a few questions, not many, not enough to fill 10 minutes. So if there are any questions uh, in uh, the audience, please uh, pop them in the chat or the Q&A uh, function uh, now. That would be massively helpful. And I want to make sure that everybody gets at least 30 seconds for closing comments. And then I'll try and try and summarize things, which I'm not looking forward to, I can tell you now. But Hans, uh, you kindly put your hand up. I just want to react on uh, one aspect of uh, what Bruno said uh, on the prognostic, prognostic uh, um, uh, value of uh, MRD tests. Uh, and. Um, uh, Martin uh, also mentioned uh, in the beginning of our meeting, uh, for example, the treatment Ixazomib. Uh, I thought uh, may maybe you could uh, uh, think with me uh, on this and, and uh, what the clinician and research perspective is, but wouldn't it be good to um, first have pilots uh, um, uh, piloting some treatments where you uh, for sure can say that MRD testing would be of a higher value than others. I could imagine, for example, Ixazomib has a different uh, uh, meaning in the treatment pathway. Uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it has a low toxicity. Uh, it, you can take it oral, so it's especially for the vulnerable older people, very valuable, but not so many people reach a really complete remission or a very deep remission. But uh, looking at daratumumab uh, or daralenalidomide dexamethasone, for example, is a very effective one. Many people uh, reach uh, complete remission. Besides that, daratumumab has a very long half-life of about five, six months. So uh, the question there could be, uh, could you, um, uh, is, is it plausible that you could have a, a treatment-free interval to rec uh, recover, for example, and then you would need MRD. So, uh, wouldn't it be good to pilot MRD testing in a clinical practice for specific treatments where you now already can see that it might have value? How do, how do you look at it as, as researcher or as clinician? Yeah, Bruno Martin, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, this is a very good point. As everything in life, of course, research costs money so if we go back to the very in initial development of these drugs these questions came already up when the trials were running that were leading to the current approvals and i think at the time understandably i have to say i'm really also raising understanding here for for the you know uh, industry that developed these drugs you know they, they made their whole financial plans employing people on the basis that the drug is used indefinitely until progression so un unless there is actually a movement in in how drug pricing is done, how you know all sides find an agreement, I'm coming back to that consensus question, that maybe a, a price could be renegotiated if you find a way of using it better for a shorter time, for example. There will just never be an incentive, for example, from uh, drug producers to run such a trial, especially when they're early in their development. They don't, they don't know yet at that time what they're revenue will be over time. I completely understand why they want to plan this. At the later stage, like now, where the drug or the treatment is used in standard of care, uh, a trial due to the regulations that we have to follow is very expensive to run, even if you don't need to pay for the drugs. It's still something where you need to monitor safety, where you need to do lots of, uh, occur lots of central funds. Now, that's a question for the public payer. And we have unfortunately seen over the last years that all of the public countries have reduced trial funding, uh, which is, uh, I think, in this circumstance, short-sighted. On the other hand, I still also feel the public shouldn't be only 
putting itself up into seeming as an as an industry unfriendly environment as well. So if you if you for example start to, start a trial, you should have an idea of how you may also disincentivize people in the future uh, uh, developing things in your country. Yeah. So I, I think it's it's a very fine balance, but you're completely spot on. I completely agree with you. You know, you probably realized, I think your your question is absolutely valid, but there have been, the environment at the moment has not been designed to necessarily support the studies, although there have been some in the making, as Bruno said, the next coming years will be actually showing some interesting data in some of these areas. of. Excellent. Okay. Um, so I'm conscious of time. Um, seven minutes left now the questions are coming in we've got no real time to answer them all which is silly of me um so um i'll just pick one one question um mrd tests being based on bone marrow biopsy and obviously the implications for patient experience and and consent etc is is not you know simple um Hans, you mentioned, or, or somebody mentioned the, pr the prospect of li liquid biopsies in the future, but is there any prospect of any other biological samples, uh, such as venous or aphoretic blood samples? Is there any other way to do it, basically? what What's on the horizon in terms of trying to overcome this issue of bone, bone marrow sample? Bruno, do you want to go for that one? Yes. I would say that's a question for Bruno. <laughs> Well, um, what I'm part of what I'm saying what that I'll be saying is, I'll, please indulge me, indulge me. Would be somehow hypothetical because it's made it's based on predictions of what we could potentially achieve according to results that are still very recent and preliminary. I believe that. Uh, to some extent, similarly to other hematological malignancies, the bone marrow will remain a, a backbone of a sample for evaluation of treatment efficacy, particularly early on during the more intensive stages of therapy, because that is where most tumor cells accumulate and therefore is the easiest sample to see if there is residual disease in patients otherwise in remission according to their immunofixation status. I believe that this will remain for the next few years. However, based on current data, I believe there could be an what is currently an hypothetical scenario where at late stages of treatment, for example, during maintenance or observation, if treatment is not until disease progression, also later on, if treatment is identical until disease progression, consecutive cycle, I'm moving to, there could be a role for minimally invasive tests. In my view, replacing the models by minimally invasive tests demands a lot from a methodological point of view and it could well be that it's not about replacing the same technique in one sample versus the other and moving from the marrow into the blood you would need a combination of methods and along that combination of methods i do believe that high sensitive measurement of the M protein, for example, using mass spectrometry, and an even more sensitive assessment of residual cells, either through sequencing or flow cytometry, slightly more sensitive than the methods that we currently have, could achieve both a high negative and high positive predictive value, and therefore replace some bone marrow aspects at late stages of frontline treatment. And I think that this could be particularly attractive in those scenarios where, for example, a treatment-free interval may be considered and where you would like to rely on frequent testing to see the outcomes of such a treatment-free interval. 
Again, I insist, this is only a hypothetical scenario based on preliminary recent data we and other groups are generating. It sounds very pragmatic. I mean, I quite like the word pragmatic, but it sounds a pragmatic approach. Martin, just very, very quickly, question for you. If a patient was to raise the topic of MRD testing with their clinicians tomorrow, what type of response would they expect? A very individualized one, I would say. It really depends on what they expect. I think it, it for me personally, it always means in a clinical setting now, yeah, we're not talking about hypothetical setting, in a clinical setting, understanding what they expect they get out of it, what I can offer as, you know, anticipate as potential answers after I have done the test. I'm really trying to get clarity before and not just jump into the test because, you know, that there might be a lot of disappointment otherwise at the other end if, if the patient does yeah. not get as much information out of it. But there are definitely situations where I feel it's, it's a very valid question and, uh, and uh, it's actually hopefully going to become more the more evidence we have based on how we can base our decisions on it. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin. So I'm going to try and sum up in, in 30 seconds. So I think that there, there is, I think, strong support for and, and an understanding of the potential utility of measuring MRD in clinical practice. I don't think anybody is disagreeing uh, with that. And I'm also convinced that MRD not just is here to stay, it's going to become more and more significant as, as the data and the need for it, uh, it, it increases. We already have lots of data, not all of which is necessarily at the right quality, um, but there's a lot of good stuff out there already. I mean, I was at ASH uh, in December and it was everywhere. <laughs> um, but there are un important unanswered questions and gaps to fill. And it's incumbent upon us all to work together to make sure that we get consensus on these, we take a collaborative approach, and we ensure that the research is of high quality moving forward. So we can't trip up moving forward as, as, best, we, as best we can. Um, we need to recognize that we're operating in a complex system. So myeloma, the myeloma system, ecosystem is complex, but but the, the system's complex between regulatory, HDA, pair, et cetera. And that's challenging to navigate because as everybody has said, there's different incentives, there's different vested interests and different rewards, which makes it very difficult for us all to get in the same boat and row in the same direction. Paula recognized that, but you also said, Paula, that we can do it, it's possible. So we should take heart and hope from this that it's challenging, but possible. And, and what we have is MPE, which I think is the strongest possible honest broker in the system we could hope to have. And I'm sure MPE will take MRD forward and, and push for the consensus, push for unification uh, in, in thinking about it and making sure that we, we identify and get consensus on the research question and ensure we, we deploy our best, the best we can to get to get that research uh, done. And I think it's important because uh, after all, we care about patients and, and, and patients are waiting. And I think that we owe it to them to make sure we've got the maximum amount of information available to support these incredibly difficult decisions that, that they have to make, but also clinicians have to make, but also health systems have to make about how they allocate scarce healthcare resources to new, new, new treatments. So really this is over to, to MPE to, to take this forward. Um, I wish them luck. Um, thank you MPE for having the foresight to, to pick up the MRD baton to do that great bit of research and report and point us all in the right direction. Uh, many thanks to the excellent and wonderful panel. You've been absolutely brilliant. And thank you to everybody uh, who took the time out of their busy day to participate uh, in, in the webinar. And uh, I'm sure MPE will be following up with everybody. So thank you all very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.